Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I'm very sorry for the slight delay. My name is Piotr Buraf, Buras. I represent the European Council on Foreign Relations. We are the host, co-host of today's uh, event, uh, uh, also the Department of Political uh, Studies uh, and International Studies is uh, co-host of today's debate. Uh, the context of this debate uh, seems to be obvious uh, with the upcoming European elections in the perspective of two months or even six weeks. A lot of people believe, and rightly so, that these elections will have great impact, not only because of the future, not only on the future composition of the European Parliament, which is uh, contrary to what many people believe is a very important uh, institution within the European Union, but the elections are going to be important also because of the fact that we are in a deep political crisis in the EU, not at European level, but uh, at the level of individual member states. Uh, in lots of member states there is a crisis of uh, party systems, there are some social and political tensions and uh, the future development of uh, national politics is uh, really insecure. This makes uh, the upcoming elections particularly interesting and they will show in what direction the European policies are going to go. The second reason for this meeting being that important is a survey conducted by ECFR in 14 EU member states. Uh, the results of the survey are partially known. Gazeta Wyborcza has published them some time ago, uh, but not all of them. Next week, a comprehensive report by ECFR will be published concerning the political situation in Europe ahead of uh, a European Parliament election. And this report will refer to the results of the survey. And I think that uh, the outcomes of the survey are really interesting and uh, it would be good to talk about them uh, with our experts. So we will refer to uh, some of the data. And if you're interested in uh, the report as a whole, please uh, make sure that you read it uh, once it is published on 17th April. I would like to welcome Ivan Krastev. Ivan is the co-author of the report and uh, he's the person who knows all the data concerning the European uh, positions on many aspects, many uh, areas that will influence uh, the European elections. Uh, the other two panelists are Katarzyna pouczyńska nawet who is uh, director of IDEA Forum at the Stefan Batore Foundation. Uh, she's a, a member of the board of uh, ECFR, former ambassador uh, uh, of Poland uh, uh, to Russia, and Sławomir Sierakowski, commentator, political scientist, co-founder of Krytyka uh, Polityczna, and also a fellow at Bosch Foundation in Berlin. I'll suggest we start uh, with a very brief statement. Uh, The poll, opinion poll conducted, commissioned by the ECFR, demonstrates a couple of interesting things that I think we should focus on today during our debate. The survey has dealt with certain important theses concerning European politics. One of them is that the upcoming elections are going to be about migration. Migration discussed at European level uh, will dominate all the other topics and therefore will have in fact people voting in favor or against open borders, in favor or against uh, refugees. And the other thesis, which is very much present in the public de debate, is that we have to deal with uh, very strong 
social polarization, polarization of the societies, uh, um, part of the society is pro-European, pro-democratic. Uh, it supports open uh, society, while the other part uh, represents uh, totally different uh, values. And this divide uh, or the representatives across this divide do not communicate with one another. The question whether these two theses uh, are true resulted in the idea of uh, holding this opinion poll because it might seem that in many cases our impressions uh, were com confirmed by the results of the poll. So let me first hand over to Ivan Krastev. Uh, I'd like to ask him what the main conclusion from the survey is according to him which of the myths or theses were confirmed or abolished by the data we got from uh, the survey thank you very much and Allow me to start with one of my favorite jokes, just to basically be clear, methodologically where we're coming from. And the joke is a Swiss joke. And this is about three boys, a German boy, a French boy, and a Swiss boy, eight, nine year old, who are discussing where the babies come from. And the German boy said they come from the sky and the parents find them in front of the door. And then the French boy became very nervous and he said, no, 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 they're coming from the bedroom. And this was the moment in which the Swiss boy jumped up and said, do not generalize. It's different from canton to canton. Uh, and I'm saying this because I'm going to give you some of our key findings. But the important for this our conversation is that Poland is not extremely representative when you compare with other countries. Because one of our first finding was that the level of polarization and tribal politics that we expected to see uh, is not exactly there. It's true for Poland, and this is not very much true for other countries. Because normally we're seeing Europe in the way we're seeing the United States and the UK, where the tribal politics is very strong, you have two camps, you know that uh, the level of, uh, when you see the relations between Remainers uh, and Brexiteers in the UK, or Republicans and the Democrats, uh, of the US to speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you really see in these cases a classical tribal politics. Just to give you an example, 29% of those who voted remain on the UK referendums are going strongly to oppose their son or daughter marrying in a family that voted for Brexit. And we expected to see this type of a polarization. For Poland, this was proved. For most of the other part of the European Union, we're seeing something very different. Not necessarily very positive, but very different. This is not polarization. This is a total confusion. 70% of those who declared that they have decided to vote say that they're ready to change their vote in the coming months. So you have people who want a change, and they can go in every direction. I was very much reminded by a children's book that they have read agents ago about some ward who jumped on his course and madly rode off in all directions at the same time. This is how the average voter in Europe outside of places like Poland goes. And he can go from the mainstream parties to basically some of the insurgent parties, but they can also go back. For example, 13% of those who voted for alternative for Germany declared that they are ready to reconsider their vote and to vote for some of the mainstream parties in the German politics. So the first kind of conclusion is the least guarded border in Europe is not the borders of Italy or Greece, but the borders between the mainstream parties and the populist parties. People go in all directions. The second story is very much about migration. 
And migration is... Uh, Ivan, maybe, if, if I may interrupt yeah. you, maybe we, we stay for a while with yeah. this um, first um, observation you made about the volatility of voters. Um, uh, and I will ask um, Sławek and Kasia to, to comment on that from the Polish perspective. I mean, how to, to what extent you, you, you believe that this polarization in Poland, um, also supported by the data, uh, is is a fixed one in 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 the Polish context? To what extent we can overcome it? No, no, no. Yes, we 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 should speak, speak Polish. I just used the uh, English since uh, Ivan didn't have his earphones. I'm very sorry for the delay. Uh, there was uh, some protest of uh, students uh, in the street, so it was not uh, up to me that I was late. Once again, once again, I'm very sorry for the delay. Okay, so the street was closed. Uh, just like Ivan said, well, Poland is not representative. This is the only country with strong polarization. This is the only country where we can say that the parties have very uh, faithful electorates. The least motivated uh, voters at the level of 60%, uh, I'd say, it's the voters of Yosna and the most mm, Faithful voters, motivated vo voters, are the voters of the Civic Platform and Law and Justice Party. The European coalition was not uh, taken into account here, uh, and the support for Platforma Obywatelska is very weak, uh, around 15 or 16 percent. But the question is who will go to the polls and not what party they will support. And what's surprising, or you might not find it surprising at all, is that uh, the report uh, refers to different kinds of emotions. And the voters, which to the highest extent resemble those who would like to protest against different things, are the voters of Vyosna, whereas the supporters of the Law and Justice Party and the Civic Platform are not that into protesting. Well, I said it's surprising because uh, Vyosna, according to myself, does not have an image that is adequate uh, to this uh, approach because I'm not sure that Vyosna can be a party of furious voters. This seems to be a party which uh, articulates uh, certain anger of the society, but it's really difficult to say. This, this is something we could uh, discuss. But that's true that migration is not the biggest concern in Poland. Healthcare, or in general health, and uh, pensions are the two major concerns in Poland. And that's what the Polish uh, voters uh, are going to be most interested in. But if we can see a rise in support for the so-called duopole in Poland, around 70-80%, the situation in Europe is the opposite. And uh, the polls uh, conducted in March, if I remember correctly, demonstrated things that could be observed two or three years ago in Europe, so a collapse of two-party systems in places where we were used to having a democracy based on two pillars. For instance, in Germany, we 
could see an end of this kind of order, even in France and Great Britain, when we, where we traditionally had this two-party divide, it turned out that uh, this no longer is the case. So the situation where winner takes it all uh, is no longer the case, and European uh, elections uh, are going to be a verification of uh, this uh, uh, situation. For instance, uh, we have a pro-Brexit party and a party against a Brexit and it might turn out that uh, the results are surprising, but I would say that the Labour Party will be successful, but it's really difficult to envisage. Uh, uh, SPD is a, a party which is no longer that much supported as it was in the future, uh, in the past. Uh, in Italy, we've got uh, uh, two populist uh, parties. Uh, uh, one is left-wing populist party and the other one is uh, right-wing populist uh, party. Also, the situation in France is uh, difficult uh, and is constantly changing. We've got a divide across uh, open society, closed society uh, line. So we can definitely see that the situation is changing and when we have a look at uh, the demographics of uh, the parties, it turns out that the Greens uh, have more uh, potential when it comes to elections and voters than any other party. And uh, their voters are most progressive and young. Well, just let me ask uh, the same question to Kasia and then to Ivan. The relatively new volatility of uh, voters in Europe, outside Poland, and polarization that we have in Poland. Uh, Kasia, if you wanted to add something regarding uh, the first question, so the perspective of Poland uh, in comparison to the rest of Europe, then please uh, feel free to do that, uh, both when it comes to uh, the traditional uh, two-party divide as well as uh, the tensions, uh, the atmosphere within Poland when it comes to the level of satisfaction, the level of happiness. And then we'll move on to Ivan and I'll ask him to uh, very briefly summarize uh, the outcomes of these phenomena for uh, the future of the political landscape in Europe. Okay, so let me start on a p positive note. In my opinion, Polish people are very much united by the European Union. We are still a society which is pro-European, one of very few remaining islands in the European uh, Union, which still supports uh, the membership uh, of the European Union, uh, the number of people, the percentage of people who would like to have poll exit is ara around 6 to 15 percent. And then uh, we've got several percent of people who think that uh, the EU is not uh, functioning properly, but they would not like to leave the EU. And 60% of the Polish society would like to remain in the European Union. And they are all happy with the fact uh, that uh, they can travel all around Europe without the need to show their IDs or passports, they are happy to be able to work across Europe and uh, they are happy that they can be open to other European countries. This is what unites Poland. But as everything in the Polish uh, politics, uh, uh, Europe uh, fell uh, hostage to a great political conflict which does not reflect uh, this divide in the Polish society concerning pro-Europeans and anti-Europeans, but rather creates this 
divide. And of course we have to look at the outcomes of the elections, which is for instance the composition of the European Parliament. And it is really uh, frustrating that the supporters of law and justice say that they would like the outcome of the elections uh, to be a defeat of uh, the civic platform. And the supporters of the civic platform claim that what they only care about is uh, that the law and justice party is defeated, which is a major problem. We have to take a broader look uh, at Europe. People are not that much interested in the program that the European Union is going to follow, which is an issue in Poland. We've got two major groups in Poland, and I would not like to forget about the third group, which is a totally different uh, group, and this is the Wiosna party. I would call one of these groups as pro-European nationalists, although it might seem might seem weird, but we, we are really fond of Europe, we are pro-European, but we want our government to decide about our internal affairs. So the question is, who should uh, run uh, trade negotiations in the name of Poland. Obviously, this needs to be the European Union, but 55% uh, of uh, law and justice voters think that it's the Polish government that should be engaged in these negotiations, and it's only 10% of uh, the law and justice supporters they believe that the EU is the right uh, institution to conduct these negotiations. And the other group uh, are pro-Europeans who want to collaborate, who would like to have uh, close alliances. And what's uh, the differentiator between these two groups is uh, the approach towards uh, the rule of law and nationalism. Because the first group believes uh, that uh, or the second group believes uh, that uh, the rule of law should be protected. And then we've got the third group, the smallest one, approximately several percent. They are revolutionary pro-Europeans. They are in favor of the EU, but in general, they are anti-system and they are frustrated in terms of economics, in terms of environment. They are not happy with the system that we live in, uh, both when it comes to uh, the benefits, financial benefits that it gives to us, and when it comes to the quality of air that we breathe. So they would like to be in a kind of Europe, but Europe that is totally different, that is revolutionized. And that's the divisions that we have in Poland, in my opinion, and the main debate held in Poland is not about, like in uh, Great Britain, whether we should stay or leave the EU, but the question is how, to what extent, in what way do we want to engage uh, in Europe? Thank you, Kasia, and now let's uh, hand over to Ivan. Uh, we are now uh, very deeply in the Polish internal affairs, but we are very much interested in your opinion. Uh, how do you see Poland against the backdrop of the rest of Europe, but also on the basis of data and the main thesis claiming that uh, uh, the main thesis about uh, tribal uh, politics outside Europe? What's your opinion on the future of politics in the European Union, the future shape of uh, the political landscape uh, in different countries of the European Union? Where are we heading? Uh, are we heading for some chaos or are we going to have a new deal, a new order that we don't know exactly uh, uh, the shape of yet? First, if you're going to ask people where they want to go, they're going to tell you that they want to go back. 67% of people believe that yesterday the world was better. 
And this is a kind of a general moment for all European societies. And by the way, of course, the age difference make the age makes a difference. But everybody who is older than 35, 40 year old, and 80 year old. This is the thing on which they agree. So from this point of view, this combination between, between confusion, anger, and nostalgia is something that is very much the major characteristics of the public mood. They had two major ideas of how the European elections was going to come. One was coming much more from Paris, the other much more from Budapest, and on the base of the data that we see, none of them are going to work. Uh, basically, Mr. Orban and Mr. Salvini believed that this is going to be European elections are going to be referendum on migration and to be much more explicit to the failure of the European Union to deal with migration. What we see on the base of the data is migration is an important issue, particularly for the Western societies, but none, in none countries with the exception of Hungary where there are no migrants, it was amongst the two most important issues. And the reasons for this are three and there is one interesting thing. And there is one interesting thing about uh, Poland and Central and Eastern Europe that we figured out. The first is the number of the migrants, people illegally coming to Europe through crossing the borders, in the last years dramatically declined. Basically, the number is equal to the number of the tourists who come to Athens in one single day in August. So this explains the fact that certain issue that two years ago was at the center of the political debate is changing. Why well, I'm saying this, if there are going to be a new pressure on the borders, this can also change easily. So if uh, you are a voter for the far right, the only thing that you should pray for is migrants coming and trying to cross European borders. This is going to change the elections in a big way. Uh, the second thing which is coming out of this is that for Central and East Europeans, but also for Italy, Greece, and Spain, emigration is more important than migration. The fear of your own people living, not so much the fear of the foreigners coming. And from this point of view, I do believe, and uh, this is something that I have been very much interested in general, this is something that is totally under-analyzed in European politics. Let's give you the data for Romania. Since 2007, 3.4 million people has left Romania to work, study, to live abroad. This is basically more than 15% of the population. And keep in mind that 70% of these 3.4 basically are people younger than 40 years. So in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Italy, in Spain, you have the combination of an aging population and exodus of young people. And this is making society kind of really fearful. To the extent, and this is probably going to be surprising news for you, in Poland and Romania, we ask the question, we ask the question everybody, uh, but in Poland and Romania, the majority of the people are going to agree the government to put certain constraints on the possibility of the people to work abroad for a longer time. Nevertheless, that open borders is claimed by everybody to be the best thing about Europe. This is also the most threatening because we like open borders when we know that it is us going out, but we are not very happy when others are leaving and this is changing the country. So if we're talking about this migration part of it, this is the most counterintuitive and most important findings, which is something that I do believe that this survey is going to have an impact on the elections because the data is very serious. For Eastern Europe, I was not so, being Bulgarian and we are basically the demographically fastest shrinking nation in modern history in the absence of war or famine. Bulgaria has lost 2 million people for the last 30 years and according to the demographic projections, we are going to lose around almost 2 million in the next 25 years. So this is depopulation is a certain things that was not discussed. Also, Mr. on the other side, from the progressive side, Mr. Macron believed that European elections are going to look like the second round of the presidential elections in France, where you're going to have a kind of a pro-European majority, and then you're going to have a minority which is betting on the nationalism and nation state. The data does not basically show also this type of a referendum logics. We ask the question, do you believe European Union works? Do you believe that national government works? 
If Macron was right, basically you're going to have a major divide between those who believe in the EU and those who believe in the nation state. We ended up with the following results. 38% of the people believe that neither the European Union works, nor the national state works. And these people answering like this are the majority in countries like Italy and France. This is basically the profile of the yellow jackets. Nothing works. It is not that they are disappointed with the European Union, but they hope that the nation state is going to solve the problem. They don't fear EU, they fear the end of the world. And on the other side, you have 24% who basically said, do you know what, European Union works, nation state works. I'm calling them the siesta voters because this is the group of people most unlikely to vote. And the younger the, they are the people in these groups, even less likely to vote. And then you have two groups, those that believe European Union works and their national government does not work. And this group is particularly represented in Eastern Europe and particularly represented in Poland. In Poland, there are more people who have a trust in the European Union than people who have a trust in their national government. And at least my Bulgarian experience tells me that we all like our government but don't want to be left alone with them. Having the European Union as a constraint, as a guarantee that uh, uh, certain things that we take for granted are not going to be taken for us is there. Only 52 million Europeans believe that the nation state is the answer. So one of the important things that has happened, particularly as a result of Brexit, is that you do not have in Europe anymore any major political party that is openly advocating the exit of the European Union or the exit from the common currency. And this makes this European election so difficult because everybody claims that they want to change the European Union, but we don't know basically what is going to be the shape of the change and how much European Union is going to survive. And I'm going to end up on this because the major thing that comes from me reading all this data, and of course this was a lot of data, and it's so different from country to country, but people want change, but they can find change in a very different places, very much based on personality of the leaders, very much based on the momentum, very much based on luck. If you're going to read the Slovak data from March, you're never going to believe that on the presidential elections, Slovakia is going to vote for a person who never was in politics and who is more liberal, particularly in her social views, than any president Central and Eastern European countries have be ever been electing. Why people voted for her? Because for them, corruption was the major issue, and they looked for somebody who is a non-politician and who have a personal integrity. And this woman basically fit this image. I'm saying this because, strangely enough, these elections are going to be decided in the last two weeks before the election campaigns. People are going very much to vote on the basis of and this is why Poland is different, because I don't see here. Here, moving from one camp to the other is basically like crossing uh, the front line uh, during the war. Uh, but in many of the countries, it's not exactly the case. People are really looking for a change. And who they are going to identify with change is very important. And just give you, as a result of it, one last data to imagine what we are talking about. You're talking about pro-Europeans, and Mr. Macron is staying very much uh, as the leader in France of the pro-European camp. So you expect that people who are going to vote for Macron uh, like the European Union. And you're going to be surprised to learn that people voting, declaring that they're going to vote for Mr. Macron are once most critical to the European Union. So basically they like the European Union in the way it could be, not in the way it is. So from this point of view, we have a situation in which people want change and this change can be different Europe or more Europe, this change can be also basically certain type of a disintegration of the European Union covered and basically dressed as a reform of the European Union. Dziękuję, Iwan. Thank you, Ivan. And I asked you about the future of the political scene in Europe, but let me ask this question later on because we'll be discussing the results of the European elections, so which party could win the elections, which direction the parties could go uh, in. But Ivan mentioned a few important issues, I believe. He referred 
to questions asked in the poll regarding whether people think that the national state works or not, whether it is effective or not, or maybe they believe that the European Union works and is effective, or maybe they think that neither the European Union nor the national state works properly. And now I would like to ask Kasia and Suavek how they see it with regard to the different profiles of the voters of the law and justice parties in Poland or the civic platform in Poland or Wiosna, which is spring, the new political party. How, what does Poland look like as compared to other countries? What are the differences? What are the similarities? If you look at the data, there were there a lot of uh, very um, interesting findings. Poland, just, just to give you an example, out of the 14 countries that were con taken into consideration in this poll, Poland is a so society in which people generally do not feel happy. There are few people who say that they are happy. If you ask them how happy they are, they usually say that they are rather down the ladder of happiness. It's like a scale between 0 and 10. 10 will be the maximum, 0 is like no happiness at all. And if you ask Polish people where they are, they usually refer to the lower part of the ladder, not the upper one. However, Kasia was saying that you can also find data which is quite optimistic. And I have now the impression that the voters of the Law and Justice Party are quite happy now. They feel happy. Now, voters, the voters of the civic platform, they, they do not seem happy with the political situation. However, they are not voters who you could call revolutionaries. They do not want a revolution to take place in Poland. They are not happy with the political situations we have now, but they do not really want a revolution, so they are not that unhappy. However, we are quite stable also in Poland right now, but what is going to come now? Maybe today we have uh, a very good economy, and depending on the voters profile, of course, but right now the government has done a lot of good things for, for, for people, not just for their voters, I mean those social benefits. So people feel quite happy. But can you um, say anything about the future based on these data? What could happen tomorrow? Could you please elaborate on this? Who would like to, to, to talk now? Maybe the person who has uh, the microphone. So let me take the floor now. I'd like to go back to this problem of tribal politics. This is something which is very typical of Poland, the Polish voters, especially those voting for the civic platform and the Law and Justice Party. Usually they have not made a decision yet whether they are going to vote. However, they have already made a decision that they will not vote for the other party. Not 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 the civic platform, but the other one, the law and justice. So if you are a civic platform voter, you are not, uh, you have not made a decision yet if you are going to vote or not, but you've already made a decision that you will not vote for the law and justice party. And the other way around, if you are a law and justice voter, you don't know whether you're going to vote, but you know that you're not going to vote for the civic platform. So it will be really about mobilizing your own voters to cast a vote. This is my impression. And if you ask Polish people about national problems or European problems, you can see that society does, does this society, Polish society does not know what a crisis is. The Polish society has forgotten what a crisis is in countries such as Italy or Greece. You can see that people know what a crisis might be and they are afraid of a crisis in Poland. This is hardly the case. Only 11% of Polish people say that a crisis could 
be a threat for the European Union. So the Polish people also do not see that there is like a particular threat, but if you ask them what this threat could be, they refer to um, Muslim, Muslim radicalism, for example. However, they do not identify this with migration. They can differentiate between the Islamic radicalism, they are less afraid of migration. However, there is a slight difference between the civic platform voters and the law and justice voters. Um, the civic platform voters do not see this as a threat at all. And now uh, what Ivan was talking about, I mean people leaving their own countries. So the problem of people leaving their countries is usually seen as a bigger problem than the migration as such, especially for the civic platform voters. They are already aware that we have this problem. Almost 40% of the civic platform voters say that this might be a threat. They are not afraid of migration, however they are afraid that too many people could be leaving Poland. So in general we could say that the Polish society is more afraid of Polish people leaving Poland than of migration. And now which system works? The Europe, does the European system work or does the Polish system work? The results in Poland are different as compared to other countries in Europe and even to other countries in our region. The Polish people Sometimes they like the Polish government, that they don't want to be alone with that government. It is true, but usually this is very much correlated with this um, tribal politics. The civic platform voters usually say that Europe works and the Polish national government does not work. Now the law and justice uh, voters think that both the European Union and the national government work well and if you force them to say what does not work they will say that Brussels doesn't work and that Warsaw works well but in the beginning they say that both are fine and the spring voters, Wiosna voters, they usually say that neither Brussels nor Warsaw works well and 37% of Polish people say that Brussels doesn't work and this is actually more than what we would have expected However, the majority is clearly pro-European. In Greece, 90% of people say that the European Union does not work. In France, 78% of people say that Europe doesn't work. However, you could say that the situations in the new member states is different. No, it's not really the, the case, because in Slovakia, 80% of people say that the European Union does not work. So, Swabek, we could say that we are an island of happiness as compared to uh, other countries in Europe. And we have good reasons to be happy. Of course, we have benefited a lot from the European funds. There has been no regression, um, economic regression in Poland. Well, the economy, you could analyze it in, in different ways. I mean, the inequality, for example, the inequality has been decreasing. However, if you compare the data provided by Polish enterprises, you could say that the inequality is actually on a rise. So it's, it is a problem. It is tricky. Our growth, economic growth, is around 5% in general, but you don't really know who gets this money, who is the real beneficiary of this economic growth. And I, I've always believed that you should look on the qualitative data and not the quantitative data. And I trust research which is based on quantitative data less in general. I do not find such research convincing. I want to look at qualitative data. I will give you one example. The example of migration. And I want to refer to what Kasia was saying. Well, nowadays migration is no longer an important topic. The Polish society is very much fond of the European Union. It is true, but just two years ago there was an, a poll 
conducted in, in, in Poland and Polish people were asked whether they would be willing to open the borders for migrants. No, no, no it was a different question. Wouldn't you wouldn't you open the borders if you were to lose the European funds? And 58% uh, said that they are ready to um, give up the European funds uh, if they can keep their borders closed. And now um, a problem of the poll exit. Well, 51% think that it is better not to have migrants in Poland even if you need to European Union. So I do not think that we do not have this problem with migration anymore. It is just a latent problem. There is an anti-migration party it is in Scandinavia, and there was an accident, there was an incident. Uh, well, you, you you don't know really who that person was. It is just a foreigner. We, we do not know exactly who that person was. But there was an incident, a violent incident, and that party was a number three, and right now it is number two among the parties in that country. So you can see how quickly this can change. Usually if you think, if you realize that this problem is an imaginary one in Poland, the problem of migration has always been an imaginary problem because we've never had too many migrants. And the same is the case in Hungary, for example. And if you have a problem which is just an imaginary one, it is something that can change overnight because it's just an issue of the political discourse. This can change overnight. And what I find most interesting is the correlation between those who say that neither Brussels nor Warsaw works well. This is the part of society that could increase because clearly there is a, a correlation between Brussels not working well and the national government not working well. It is of course difficult to cope with any crisis, geopolitical crisis or economic crisis if you are isolated and isolation is what is happening right now. We have no longer good alliances in Europe, even the alliance between Germany and France um, does not seem to work anymore. The new president of the Christian Democrats in, in Germany, well, she is clearly against France, for example, the Security Council um, in the United Nations, they well, there is the proposition that it should be the European Union that will be represented in that council, Security Council of the United Nations, and not France. So France should give its uh, place, its seat in that on that council to the European Union. So you can see that this new political leader in Germany uh, proposes solutions which are clearly against France, and it's very radically so. So it's like Jaroslav Kaczynski. So Kaczynski does not want to rule the European Union, but he does not want to be ruled by the European Union. And Germany seems to be fed up, like everyone wants something from Germany and Germany does not want to um, be used in that way. And we have a clear rule in the European Union, uh, whoever rules in Germany rules in the European Union. And all those bridges, all those alliances, the French and German alliance, this this bridge of stability between the UK and Germany, they no longer work. And the, the, the alliance between the Visegrad um, countries, the Visegrad group and Germany, well, this does not work anymore and Germany is becoming very much orthodox in economic terms and France, as, 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 as declared in the manifest published by uh, Macron, they want to be more orthodox in economic terms as well. 
and they all dream about a better future, all of them, including the decision makers. And that's why we are so confused. All the politicians want to take the European Union to another direction. And it's hardly a surprise that it's very confusing for the voters. Because this, this change that we want for the European Union looks different in all the member states. It is confusing. And there is actually no single topic that would be relevant and important for all European people. And I think the situation is going to be worse and worse. Can you imagine European elections where there has been a change this week? If we have elections in the UK now, the distribution of power in the European Union will be a different one. So we thought that the Brexit would uh, make the two biggest parties equal in the European Union and that's why the People's Party in the European Union would need Fidesz because n there would be no uh, British party uh, joining the European People's Party. So that's what we expected and if we now should consider that the UK will actually organize European elections, well, it's, it's different. The situation becomes totally different. Jarosław Kaczynski does not want to join any right-wing, extreme right-wing coalition. So there will be at least two or maybe even four uh, groups on the right wing side. So right now you can hardly say anything about the outcome of the European elections um, with regard to the distribution of power in the European Parliament. You can say a lot of things about the different member sa states and, and what the outcome will be in the particular member states, but you can hardly say what the real distribution of power will be in the European Parliament. And this shows that first the European Union could be more democratic because you've got voters and they vote in this democracy. Uh, but the European elections in 2014 were a nightmare. Before these elections, it was already clear who would be the president of the Commission of the European Parliament, etc. So the voters thought that um, thought like idiots because they didn't really feel that the vote they were going to cast would matter in any way because all decisions had already been made, and the voters had really no influence on what would be going on later after the elections. Now the situation is totally different. Nie wiadomo, znaczy nie wiadomo, jest ta chwiejność wyborców. Nie ma właściwie jednego ważnego tematu, który łączyłby Europejczyków, gdzie, gdzie mieli, moglibyśmy powiedzieć, że te wybory będą, nie wiem, o migracji, albo o, o zmianach klimatycznych, albo o gospodarce. Właściwie taki jeden temat, który, który byłby dominujący w tej debacie publicznej nie istnieje, więc to, to powoduje, że trudno przewidzieć, jak wyborcy będą się w jakich krajach zachowywać. Trzeba patrzeć rzeczywiście na te bardzo narodowe dyskusje, ale ja chciałem Iwana zapytać o jeszcze jeden, zanim też Państwu umożliwię stawianie pytań, to, to chciałem Iwana zapytać o jeden jeszcze taki element tego podziału w Europie, podział na wschód i zachód, to znaczy jak, czy, czy to jest może jakaś stała, czy, czy w tych, z tych wyników wychodzi, że ten podział między wschodem a zachodem się odnawia lub może nigdy nie zginął, czy też również mamy do czynienia z pewnym mitem, który, który, który należy obalić. Thank you very much. There was no translation, but I do, re I do believe that I got the question. Uh, so <laughs> uh, About the East-West uh, yeah, 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 divide yeah. in, in uh, Europe. No, uh, this is very important. Uh, just to make one point on this, because they're going to be highly fragmented parliament. And the problem is everybody is asking how much the far left and far right is going to take. But what is also going to change very much is the nature of the mainstream parties. So if European Parliament before very much resembled the German Parliament where you have a big conservative group, you have a big socialist group, they're going to make a majority and it was very much consensual politics. So I do believe that nevertheless that we don't know exactly how people are going to vote, you're going to end up with something that very much resembles the Dutch Parliament. A lot of parties 
difficult to make a majority, ad hoc majorities, and even basically the commission quite often is going to be with the minority support. And I believe this is going to be a different world. We can like it or dislike it, but it's very different than what we know. And from this point of view, East-West divide, which was, uh, there was the story that uh, the West is going to stay for Europe while the East is going wild and basically uh, totally liberal. Uh, on the base of the data that I see, in certain way, Poland can become the most positive surprise uh, if uh, the elections are going to work well for the opposition. And don't f uh, uh, forget, to such an extent, everything happening in Europe is based on the news coming from one or two countries, that if on the night of the elections it appeared that basically Polish opposition is doing better than the government, all the story of Central and Eastern Europe is going to change. Uh, because, first of all, Central and Eastern Europe is not as unified as people believe on anything than the common position on uh, migration after the refugee crisis. And secondly, and uh, this is my last point, is when you read also the data and the voters' preferences, one of the major questions is how united the Eurosceptic right could be. And I know that Mr. Salvini came here and trying to talk about uh, the Rome-Warsaw coalition. And as a negative coalition, it can stand. You can end up even with a situation in which symbolically this type of a parties are going to come with a block which is the biggest in the European Parliament. But then when you go and see where their voter stands, I'm going to give you just three issues, one of which I want to be present in the room when basically Mr. Salvini and Mr. Kaczynski are going to negotiate. Common position on Russia. Italy at the moment is the most pro-Russian country in the European Union. Uh, compared with the position of the current Italian government, basically Germany a hoax on Russia. Secondly is about the budgets. When it comes to the European budgets, uh, the major point of Italy and all of the southern countries was that because of the financial crisis hurt this crisis, this country is more than anybody else, the most money should go to Spain, to Greece, to Italy. The position of East Europeans always was that because we still are much poorer uh, than the Western Europe, this is the type of disparity that should be uh, uh, get together. Uh, so I'm saying all this because uh, and the third thing that goes very much also about uh, 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 on Russia and uh, when it comes to uh, uh, basically is uh, the problem of what is uh, the major orientation, which are the priorities of this country's coming. And for the South, it's very much basically what is happening with Africa. And uh, we're even talking about a totally different type of uh, migration. And for East European countries, it's very much about Ukraine and what is happening in the post-Soviet space. I'm saying all this because on the night of the elections, it's going to be symbolic politics more than anything else. And from this point of view, I do believe that, nevertheless, that we said that Poland is very different in some of its dynamics, people are going to look outside of their own countries, only in four or five countries what is happening there. Berlin and Paris, for sure, everybody is looking, but one is going to be Warsaw, and probably one is going to be Rome. So from this point of view, I do believe that, in a certain way, the elections results in Poland are going probably to have more symbolic impact of how Europeans are going to perceive European Union after these elections than most of the elections that we're going to witness. Thank you. Once again, now I would like to uh, open the floor for questions, if there are any questions uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask them. Who pass the mic? Uh, thank you. My question is for Ivan uh, Krastev, because the point you mentioned about labor mobility is not only an argument like in public opinion, but also now on the political agenda. Last week, do, uh, last weekend, like the, um, there was an informal meeting uh, under the Romanian presidency, and I think for the first time we had the government saying that labor mobility is a good thing, but there are also negative effects. And it's also quite unusual because usually we had this east-west divide, western countries uh, defending their labor markets against well, cheaper labor uh, coming from the east, and eastern countries uh, trying to keep open this uh, market for and freedom of um, 
circulation, uh, circulation and, and labor. Like, do you do you think this kind of um, new maybe uh, convergence of positions? Also, like about Poland, if we listen carefully to what uh, Mateusz Morawiecki says about uh, Poles living in the UK, I think there is some will on in Warsaw that yes, it would be good to maybe restrict this right so that these Poles could come back to the country and work for here and not for other other countries. Do you think this um, this issue can have some political developments uh, towards a restriction of labor uh, mobility? Thank you very much. For me, this is a, uh, it's going to be a central question in these two-est relations because it's going to be even more complicated. I agree very much with you that till five or ten years ago, East Europeans were pushing very much and insisting on labor mobility, open borders. And the Western countries are saying this is a problem, we have a domestic political pressures, too much migration and so on. Three things happened. First, if you look around, most of the Central and East European countries do not have an unemployment problem, they have a labor shortage problem. There is nobody to hire. Uh, and this is a huge issue for our countries where basically the attractiveness of foreign investment is very much based on a relatively qualified but cheap labor. Uh, so all our business model now is uh, uh, in question. Uh, secondly, what has changed very much is that the more successfully we are protecting the external borders, the more we, we succeed not to have uh, migrants coming from outside Europe, Eastern Europe and Central Europe becomes the major labor reserve for the Western markets and particularly for the German markets that is missing around one million people. And this is going to be also a clash of interests on this. And I do believe that this is particularly important because seeing also from what I see in Bulgaria and other places, the first sectors that are most hurt out of out migration is the health sector. Listen, in Bulgaria these days it's much easier to find an honest politician than a nurse. And nurse is even more difficult than doctors. It's a huge issue. And particularly with the aging population, this is becoming a major issue. And also don't forget that with a big migration, it's not simply the migration of people, this is a migration of voters. When somebody was asking me where the labor uh, voters are, are from Eastern Europe, I said they're in Western Europe. So this is why you cannot see them on the elections. Uh, but secondly, it's a major transfer of money. All the money invested in the education of a doctor who decided basically to go and to work abroad are money that are leaving the country. So how to compensate for this? How to create a situation in which you're going to have a much more mobility to the West and back? How are you going, for example, to compensate uh, for some of the shortages in the health system of these European countries? This is something to be discussed. But for the first time, our governments are starting to talk about this because before we didn't know how to talk about it. And this is also very much dividing countries. Uh, my last point is that this is not true for all East European countries. The countries that are most crashed by the depopulation are the Baltic Republics. Baltic Republics basically lost around one third of their population. And imagine we're talking about such a small societies. But there are countries like the Czech Republic where for the last 30 years only 4% of the population left. Compare this with basically what's happening in Poland or Bulgaria or Hungary. Uh, also the nationalistic rhetoric was one of uh, the ways to try to stop people emigrating. If you're listening basically uh, to the rhetoric of Mr. Orban, uh, this nationalist rhetoric which became so popular in the last years, one of its aims is also to try to convince people not to emigrate. Uh, because our countries particularly, Hungary is facing a problem not very different than the problem GDR faced in 1961 when they be built the Berlin Wall. You try to stop basically uh, the exodus of uh, young uh, uh, workers. I'm saying this because more people have left Hungary for the last 10 years than after 1956 uprising. So from this point of view, nationalist rhetoric is not enough to keep people in the country. And how this is going to be addressed is the big issue. I expected this to come as a very central for the elections. And if there is one thing of this study that I do believe we're going to achieve, is to try to push people talking about emigration as a problem. Because before our fears of emigration have been very much expressed as a fear of migration. Dziękuję bardzo. Jerzy Margański, tam... Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now, fifth row. Question from the fifth row. 
Let's collect uh, questions so that our speakers can refer to them later on. Uh, my question uh, is addressed to uh, Mr. Sierakowski. Could you please uh, speak a bit louder? Do you also think uh, that the assessment of uh, German-French uh, relations uh, and different kind of relations uh, between different organs, uh, bodies within the European uh, Union. So how do you assess these relations? Do you think they are positive, they are negative? You mentioned an article of a new leader of uh, Christian Democrat Party in Germany a new opening in German-French uh, relations, Treaty uh, of Aachen. But we could say that we have no response, no joint response uh, to the new phase of French-German relations and the new challenges in the world. There are lots of uh, different opinion concerning Eurozone and the issue of common uh, security and defense policy within the EU, so it could be expected uh, that uh, France and Germany reach uh, a certain conclusion, but uh, there is no agreement between these countries. You seem to believe that this depends uh, to a certain extent on the internal uh, situation, political situation in Germany, the lack of uh, leadership uh, within the main political party in Germany. You think this is the reason uh, for the backlogs. But don't you think that uh, the context of the problem is wider and the readiness uh, to look for joint solutions in France and in Germany uh, is very much uh, restricted at the moment. Don't you think that even after we have a change uh, of uh, uh, the government in Germany, which will certainly happen sometime in the future, don't you think that uh, the situation is not going to change and uh, that we are not going to have any significant progress? Uh, thank you. I know that Swavek would like to respond, but there are two more comments or questions. Professor Płatek and a lady from uh, the third row. Second row, sorry. I've got a question for Mr. Ivan Krastev, which will be following a bit what we were already talking about. Free movement of people is one of the major values of European Union. And I don't know if the free movement of people is equal to immigration. But the immigration that you're talking about, from the countries that you're talking about, well, it's not an easy thing for people to move away. And the reason they are moving away are quite vital. So do we have instruments and where they should be placed within each of the country of the European Union or on the base of the European Union, not to stop it, but to actually uh, cut off the real reason people are going away. It's not only the very low wages, but it's also the, the condition, environment and attitude that we have to people that make them actually to emigrate. Thank you Thank you, Anais Mara, University, uh, University of Warsaw. Uh, I have a question to actually all panelists, although it's uh, mainly Mr. Krastev has raised the issue uh, so far, has pronounced the word Russia, uh, which I thought is uh, perhaps the elephant in the room, because if I we understand the title of the um, of, of the event, Kto porwie Europe, you know, like it's a, it's a topic that comes back pretty often. Uh, if we follow you on 
Um, one of your main findings that uh, the uh, public opinion are extremely vulnerable to last minute events. Uh, how did you factor in uh, the possibility of a Russian destabilization slash disinformation campaign that could uh, happen uh, in one or several countries of Europe uh, the week before the elections? And uh, is it actually a question that, you, that, that was asked during the survey? Uh, how do people relate, not necessarily to Russia, but to the uh, reliability liability or, or dangerousness of Russian media. Thank you. Dziękuję bardzo. Może zacznijmy od Sławka, potem... Thank you. Let's begin with Sławek. The question about Russia was also interesting and I think that it was addressed to Ivan and to Kasia. Ja bym poszedł Warunkowania są nie tylko wewnątrz systemu politycznego. Well, to be honest, I couldn't agree more. It is very difficult to find any party. It's not SPD, definitely. And it was Olaf Scholz that made this proposition that we should give up uh, the office in in Brussels, in, in Strasbourg, the, the, the European Parliament's office in Strasbourg. And I believe that businesses will be against it. And I think it is something like, like a, a budget fetishism. We have this problem with Germany. There is a huge economic inequality because of Germany, because of the common currency. So Germany has a huge advantage gained during um, the financial crisis and as a result of the enlargement of the European Union. So right now Germany has a huge advantage when it comes to the export. Germany used to be the biggest exporter worldwide, but Germany does not spend the money they make. They have a surplus of 8% every year when it comes to um, commercial exchange. And the surplus of 8% contributes to this inequality, economic inequality. And another consequence of um, the Brexit is that the advantage of Germany will be even bigger. So it is Germany that sells much more products to the UK than the other way around. And that's why Germany is not ready to accept the completion of the European reform so that the Eurozone could be enlarged by other dimensions, like the fiscal dimension. And the effect is, at the end of the day, that Manuel Macron has become quite aggressive recently. The suspension of Orban, where he said logique de clan, like it's a logique de clan, uh, it's the logic of a clan, that's what he said about the suspension of Orban. And the result is well, I, I like even like this word coined by Jarosław Kaczyński, impossibilism, which means impossibilism. So wherever Germany does not want to enter, well, please take a look that the Germany is the last country when it comes to the development of the Internet. It's very often not possible to pay by card in Germany. You need an ATM and it might be difficult to find an ATM in Germany. So the ATM network is very poor in Germany. It's uh, You have a monopole of Deutsche Telekom. So Germany is really far behind all the other countries. If you have a person from Ukraine that goes to Germany, well, it's like a person traveling from the first world to the third world country between Dusseldorf and Cologne. There, there is no good internet. If you uh, go by train from Berlin, it will be Frankfurt, where you will have access to the internet on the train. Um, well, you will have that access on the Polish border if you travel by train from Berlin. And the airports, the, the Berlin airports, uh, are the worst in the European Union. And they have been constructing an airport, a new airport in Berlin for 15 years, and it has not been completed yet. And this shows how strange the economic situation is in Germany, because the German society is um, 
very a very fetishist society when it comes to the currency and the Tories have now become a very Eurosceptical party I do not if you remember the Black Wednesday uh, the UK wanted to join the Eurozone and they would have this Euro if it had not been for the Black uh, Wednesday but Germany left the UK alone was when George Soros um, made a billion pounds on one date so the UK spent a lot of money to protect its currency and that's why it left the currency corridor and the Tories understood that they need to rely on themselves when it's uh, when it comes to uh, fiscal politics so the only country that has the potential to um, propose an economic uh, reform in the European Union that would be Germany and Germany is quite isolated as I have illustrated and when we uh, take a look at China which has not been mentioned yet today Poland is the society which is the least interested um, one when it comes to China and if Germany is does not become active well China does and China is very active in Portugal, in Italy, um, so you can imagine that you will have a lot of economic activity by China in Europe. And Trias has been purchased by China and it is one of the biggest harbors uh, in, 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 in Europe and it could have been purchased by Germany but it was purchased by China not by Germany. You don't have any more time, I'm sorry I need to interrupt you. So now we just have a few minutes left, it's just, I really very much enjoy what you're saying and I enjoy listening to you but we don't have any time. Ivan, would you like to make your comments now? responses and of course uh, Kasha on Russia who's, uh, who know much more on me. First let's uh, uh, defend the Munich airport. I'm not going to call him the worst in Europe, just on the factual side. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, uh, first your point is very well taken because it's not an emigration in the way it was. People come, people go and I do believe this is very important because it very much resembles the movement from the rural areas to the urban areas in 60s and 70s. And I do believe that it's very important to try to see all the policies that try to basically go with the disbalance that came uh, in these areas when people have been kind of massively moving. But this is also very important because if you're a young person uh, in a country and you don't like very much what your government is doing and you don't like the atmosphere, so you're going to vote for the opposition, you're going to protest, but after two or three years, you understand that if you want to change your life, it's much easier to change the country than to change the government. And I do believe this exit option, which is particularly strong for the younger people who also for demographic, demographic reasons are very small cohort, they don't have the numbers to produce a change, is something that we're seeing in many of, uh, uh, of our countries. And on Russia, we have a block of questions on Russia. And what comes is, and this is very important, European Union cannot be consolidated on the base of the external threat. Even in Poland, Russia does not come as the major threat. Radical Islam comes as a bigger security threat, which for me was a surprise. And Russia does not come as a threat in almost half of the countries at all. The same for China, the same for Turkey. So from this point of view, the European Union, unlike a classical nation state that is looking for unity basically on the consolidation of the external threat, not. And of course, there was a special group of questions trying to see how the Russian uh, interference on the model of what happened on the American elections can basically work. Here country, you see that people are aware of this, uh, but do you believe that your government is prepared or not? Very much depends not how you view Russia, but how you view the government. On the Polish data, those who said that they're going to vote for uh, the Law and Justice Party said that Poland is very well prepared to do anything uh, to respond basically to the provocation coming from Russia. Those who vote for the opposition parties has a very different views. So when you ask basically on the threat of uh, uh, the foreign interference, it's much more answer on the capacity of your government than basically very much detailed analysis of what basically can come from the outside. Kasia, a few words about Russia. 
please speak into the mic. Well, Russia, Russia as a player, as a factor that could interfere with the European elections and not just the European elections that we are going to have now, but also the elections to come. Well, it is an issue that's, that's being debated all the time, so it's not like we don't know about it. It's not like we have never experienced it. The European society, the European leaders, the European Union, they have all experienced such interference from Russia, and this interference c can take many different forms. It could uh, be related to the presence of Russia on the social media, or different incidents, whether they are true or maybe maybe not like you there could be a rape but you could actually say that there was a rape even though no one was raped at all and maybe a, a, a potential threat of um, huge migration from libya to the european union this is something you cannot really verify in and define 100 percent however you could say two things first russia is powerless if the European Union is strong. If you have no weakness in Poland, Russia cannot do anything. What what kind of weakness do I mean? This could be the fear of migration, of Islam, or maybe this idea that the European system does not work well. This could be used by Russia. However, our weakness is very often related to the fact that the government start using the same methods that Russia uses. So if we have governments in Europe that use the methods that were applied only by Russia in the past, you just find yourself unable to differentiate between European government and the Russian government, because there is no difference at all. And it's very difficult to strike a line where are these methods applied by ourselves to ourselves and where are they applied just by Russia and even you said that we have no clear division when it comes to what is on stake in the European elections well we don't have traditional issues like Islam or economy or migration. However, there is a line, and I would draw it in the following way. We have particular forces that just want to take their share of interest and they don't care about they don't care about the common uh, um, values and common good. Uh, they just want to have their particular interests um, taken care of. And on the other hand, you would have people who want to care about the European Union as such. They are more likely to invest in community, and Russia knows it very well and they exploit it quite efficiently because they support the destructive forces in Europe whether they are right wing or left wing sometimes they are populists sometimes they might be authoritarian but it is a clear line between those who just care about themselves about their own interests and those who care about the community and it is not important what the exact proportion is whether it's 70 to 30 or another proportion but it is a clear line that might be very important for the future on Europe and the difference here would be small two maybe three percent and uh, the impact that Russia could have on the European elections does not need to be big because it, the difference could be really about just two or three percent on the country level where you need to fight for every single percent of uh, voters and these are small percentages that could be decisive for the future of the European Union as well and this can be exploited by Russia. So Kasha made it clear that there is a line in Europe, a line dividing those who care just about their particular interests and those who care about the community as such and this leads me to the title of our meeting, who will convince Europe in the elections and what do you think what will be the crucial outcome of these elections what should we 
um, take into consideration what should we expect as the result, as the outcome of the elections which are going to take place in May. What do you think? What is the, the, the most important consequence that we should expect? Well, it was a very difficult question, but I think it was in a way answered during the discussion. And Kasia talked a bit about the fact that Russia is able to seize Europe. But at the same time, she said that we do not have two blocks, one of which is pro-Russian and the other one anti-Russian. And I would rather agree with Ivan, who said that these elections are not going to focus on one topic only. Disintegration of Europe is the main item on Russians' agenda. Because they are unable to compete with uh, the EU as a whole, but they are able to win different kinds of battles with individual member states. And it is the case that uh, countries such as uh, Poland uh, execute Russia's policy, for instance, uh, uh, provide some chaos. And I think that even said something I agree with, and I wrote about it lots of times, Poland is uh, a swing state. When it comes to these elections, uh, I would be most interested in Germany and in Poland. And when I travel around Europe, uh, the experts that I talk about are also most interested in Germany and Poland. Germany might uh, generate lots of uh, ideas and uh, conclusions, uh, but Poland is uh, big enough, very much polarized, and it will be able to start uh, a certain collapse of populism because the populists have not been defeated yet. Chaputova defeated uh, populists uh, in the direct battle. But apart from that, the president of uh, Slovakia is uh, a function that which does not have much importance. Yes, this is a very important conclusion regarding as what we can expect from these elections. Ivan, do you have anything? To uh, I, I have one very simple point. After these elections, none of the major questions that we discussed is going to be solved. But after these questions, all kind of political leaders, but also citizens, are going to reevaluate what are the chances for European disintegration. And don't forget big political projects collapse in the way the bank collapse. If I fear that European Union can disintegrate, I'm going to change my politics in order to hedge and to be prepared for different type of an options. And this is the biggest story. The psychological effect of the European elections are going to be much more important. What is the feeling? Is the crisis in a certain way under control or is the crisis deepening? Going on, uh, or just one uh, following Kasia on Russia. There is quite important. We believe that we know what the Russians want. And I was recently in Moscow. In a certain way, they cannot make their mind because there are three different things that works well, one is Russia is not against United Europe if this United Europe is going to be accountable to the United States. And they believe that only United Europe can expel United States from the European continent. Russia probably also is not against if they're going to have a two-speed Europe and basically East European countries, which they don't like much, 
are going basically to be uh, taken out. And of course, Russia is not going to uh, suffer if they're going to be total disintegration. Nevertheless, that in trade and economic relations, a major disintegration of the European Union is going to be a big economic issue also for Russia. So from this point of view, Russian politics at the moment, at least in the way I read it, is much more simpler. And this is to support every political party which is going officially to say that they have a pro-Russian policies, particularly on sanctions, and try to punish, punish others. So they follow the logic that in a difficult moment, you should have a very simple policy. Kasia, the last word is to you. Kasia, the last word. Dojaśniła tezę o porwaniu. Europa w moim przekonaniu zależy jednak od Europejczyków, nie od Rosji. To, że Rosja może mieć te 2% w te lub 1 w te, to zależy przede wszystkim od nas. Zależy nie od Brukseli, a od krajów członkowskich. Nigdy tak nie zależało od Polski, jak będzie zależało przy tych wyborach, co nie, 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 nie znaczy, że od Polski zależy, przede, od Polski zależy przede wszystkim. I rzeczywiście ten wymiar psychologiczny jest niezwykle ważny i to jest zła wiadomość, że Polacy będąc euroentuzjastami są równocześnie europesymistami. Prawie 60% z polskiego społeczeństwa uważa, że Europa się rozpadnie, wierzy w to w ciągu 20 lat. Może, no, może, no tak, dopuszcza to, że może się rozpaść i jesteśmy na tym ekstremum bardziej pesymistycznym w Europie, paradoksalnie, niż szereg innych krajów. Być może dlatego, że czujemy, że mamy więcej do stracenia. Mamy, mamy bardzo dużo do stracenia. Dziękuję bardzo, dziękuję bardzo bardzo naszym panelistom za tą bardzo, moim zdaniem, ciekawą rozmowę. Ja trochę jestem smutny z tego powodu, że na to pytanie, kto porwie Europę, nie udało nam się odpowiedzieć w takim pozytywnym sensie, no bo porwanie Europy to może być, porwanie Europy może być negatywne przez Rosję, przez populistów, przez, przez tych, którzy, którzy chcą zagarnąć ten projekt europejski, ale może mogłoby być też właściwie zdefiniowane w sposób pozytywny, że porwiemy Europę jakimś pozytywnym przekazem, pozytywnym pomysłem na tę Europę, no ale to pewnie jest dosyć trudne, ale może tak jak Sławek sugeruje, może Polska porwie Europę i to, i to może byłoby naj, na, byłby najlepszy wniosek. Możesz, jeszcze jedno zdanie. Skoro masz, po, jeżeli pozytywne zdanie, to może. Pozytywny, może to jest idealistyczne, ale w moim przekonaniu i wybory słowackie to trochę pokazują, że jeżeli przywódcy potrafią mówić o wartościach w sposób autentyczny, to być może nigdy wartości europejskie nie miały takiej szansy na porwanie Europy jak teraz, tylko one muszą iść w połączeniu z przywództwem, które jest autentyczne. Jeśli to połączenie zaistnieje, to siła może być wielka. No to jednak zakończyliśmy taką pozytywną e, e, refleksją. Ja bardzo dziękuję Państwu również za obecność, za Państwa aktywność, uwagi i, i wysłuchanie naszej rozmowy. Tutaj zachęcam Państwa do e, lektury raportu ICFR, który ukaże się, jak już mówiłem na początku, w przyszłym tygodniu, 17 kwietnia. Będziemy go wszystkim Państwu rozsyłać. Będzie obecny, też dostępny na naszej stronie internetowej. Także zapraszam do lektury. Który, no i do dalszej dyskusji, bo będziemy ją, to jest dopiero w zasadzie początek, też nie tylko dlatego, że kampania wyborcza się dopiero rozpoczyna, ale też dlatego, że te wszystkie te tematy wykraczają daleko poza horyzont wyborów do Parlamentu Europejskiego. Dziękuję bardzo, życzę Państwu miłego popołudnia i miłego weekendu.